Hello. Hi, how are you doing? I'm fine. Spring is in full force. Uh, the nightingales have arrived. Um, it's all very nice. Excellent. Oh, I'm so fine. I'm just watching a crow chasing a buzzard across the, uh, across the park. <laughs> That's <laughs> wonderful. The first question I have is mainly for our listeners. So why did you decide to write this book? Sometimes I think that self-delusion is the most important part of success. I started the project having no no sense of what it was like to write a book, and I, I had at that time been working as a journalist for The Economist magazine, and the book grew out of a piece that I had written for Christmas one year. And I thought to myself, I'm a journalist, I write at this speed, a book is this long, so I'll be done in about six months. Uh, four years later, <laughs> I uh, slowly emerged. But I chose the subject because I, I wanted to... So let me back up slightly. I, I had done my uh, doctoral work on the evolution of sex, and in particular, what sex is for at all in biology. Why, why don't we all just split in half and clone ourselves. Why is it that when you look at the tree of life, most organisms are engaged in sexual behavior of some kind? And I realized that once you ask this question, or once, once, once sex exists, then you have a lot of consequences. And so the book is really an exploration of those consequences. And at the same time, I wanted to make it fun and accessible, so I decided to create this character called Dr. Tatiana, who gets letters from organisms that are upset about their sex lives. But there's a sort of secret agenda, so ostensibly it's about sex and silly happenings and, oh my goodness, my, my lover is 200,000 times smaller than me as is usual, and, but it's also about the diversity of nature, because once you have sex, then you also have all kinds of pressures that, that come to shape the evolution of, of traits. So, so you start to have singing and dancing, you start to have organisms fighting over each other for mates, and, and so much of what we see in nature is actually a consequence of the fact that sex happens. And so it's also a book about the diversity of nature. That's fabulous. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely what I got reading it. I thought, oh my gosh, there's so many different life forms out there. It's crazy. So I'm curious, as far as your research process with the book, how did you end up researching all the different cases you bring out? Was it more just kind of, I'm looking for the weirdest, you know, case studies in this certain behavior? Or was it more of, I've heard stories of this animal? Or how did you go about that process? I mean, part of it was that I was I was trying to show a number of different things in the course of the book. I mean, the, although each question and reply could be read by itself, it could be a standalone thing. I also wanted them to build up into something bigger, that, and so I, although you could read the book in any order, I think you get more out of it if you read it from beginning to end. And I wanted to, I wanted to look at processes from why females mate with multiple males sometimes, to how often do you find monogamy and which species actually engage in monogamy. And so I was looking for organisms that were interesting and unusual examples, but at the same time I was looking for subjects that I could put into a more general theme. And so sometimes the, the, so the, the letter comes from organisms ranging from green spoon worms to chimpanzees and hyenas and, and so on, but, they, but sometimes the, 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 mo the more interesting and strange behavior is not in the letter itself, but actually in the reply, because in the reply, Dr. Tatiana is trying to explain how such things could have evolved. And so she's also going through and, and saying, well, here are some other examples like yours that we know of. So, for example, in the case of the green spoon worm, which is the one that has uh, where the female is 200,000 times larger than the male, it's the largest known size difference between male and female where the female is bigger. Uh, and But it turns out that there are a number of other cases that are that are similar, not as extreme, but similar. And it turns out that there's, that there's a single underlying explanation for them, which is that in these cases where the females are very much larger than the males, it turns out that the females also don't move very much. And so therefore, for a male's point of view, the difficult thing is finding a female in the first place. And so basically, they, as soon as they're at the minimum size that they need to be able to survive, they begin looking. 
And so in the Australian redback spider, which is uh, a bit like the black widow, the, the males are very much smaller than the female, but only 13% of males are thought to find a female at all. And so, and so as a result of, of looking at this diversity, you also start to see patterns, and that's part of what appealed to me about the project. I, certainly it was quite hard work to, to do the research. In particular, at that time, not very much was available online when I was doing it, and so I spent a lot of time in libraries. It's not nearly as glamorous as I thought it would be. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure it's a lot of work. I'm curious because I think you touched on this a bit earlier, but did you write each letter to correspond with a specific mating pattern? You say, you know, the book does build up to this ending, which I thought was really surprising. But, you know, I'm curious if you, when you wrote each letter, you were like, okay, I want it to talk about this pattern and this pattern and this pattern. It was more organic than that, I think. One of the things that I've learned is that writing doesn't always do what you're expecting it to do. I've never been somebody who can write from an outline. I I think that it can be useful to outline things as you go along, but I don't make an outline that I then work from because when I start writing, things I wasn't expecting to happen, happened. So for example, I tried and tried and tried to write a reply to a swan called Zeus. <laughs> and in the end, Zeus doesn't appear in the book because I, I just never managed to reply. I, and somehow Zeus was asking the wrong question. I couldn't answer his question. Uh, so I had to choose some, something else. I think in the end I chose black vultures instead. And so sometimes, I mean, I realized sometimes if, if the writing wasn't behaving as I, was, as I was hoping it was going to, if I couldn't answer the questions for some reason, often it was because there was something wrong with the question. It was The question was taking me in, in a direction where the material I had didn't support it or, or, or just couldn't, the material I had didn't go with the question that I'd actually written. And so then I would have to rework everything and sort of think, okay, well, the problem is actually right at the beginning here. Sure, absolutely. So I know you talked about the green spoonworm before, but I'm curious, was that the weirdest animal to research or was there another really strange animal that you, in your research process, was like, oh my goodness, this is so different than what I was expecting? I think that the diversity is, you, you can pick, you can point at a huge range of different strangenesses. I mean, one of the things that I think is fascinating and strange is the way that in some species of wasp, the, well, in, in many species of insects, the males hatch from unfertilized eggs and the females hatch from fertilized eggs. So it's quite different from what happens with us. And because of that, it means that if a female has not mated, she can lay an egg and it will hatch and it will be her son. And she can then have sex with her son and then have daughters. And this actually turns out to be reasonably common practice among quite a lot of insects. And I think that this is fascinating and in so many different ways. First, first of all, it, it, it's very confronting for humans because it's such a, it's so very different from the way that human mating behavior uh, proceeds. But it's also, it's a fascinating consequence of a genetic system that is very different from our own. And I, I find that endlessly interesting and absorbing. Definitely. What I like about, I think, what I really like about studying the diversity of nature and, and looking using evolution as a way to think about the diversity of nature is that many of the details that at first seem like just another thing that you have to know if you want to know about living organisms, suddenly you realize that, that, that the details can be made sense of and they're part of a bigger picture. And then they become not just something you have to memorize, but something that's really interesting. Absolutely. That kind of leads into my next question, which, and I know you touched on it before, but, you know, you're writing this book about the variety of different behaviors and, and just different patterns that you see. And I'm curious if, you know, why do you think it's important for people, specifically the public, to know about the evolution of these sexual behaviors? I think it's important for everybody to know something about the place we live. And I think that, I mean... There, there t I think there are two different parts to the question. I mean, sex is everything that is, sex is something that everybody knows something about. And so it's also very easy for people to relate to sexual behavior in other contexts. I mean, it, I didn't have to, I didn't, some people think that it's, that it's a, a funny book, but I didn't have to try very hard for it to be funny. 
mm-hmm. because all you have to do, you don't have to make any jokes. You just have to stand back and describe the behavior. And the behavior is funny by itself because inevitably one imagines oneself in absurd circumstances, even though these organisms are so very different from us. But at the same time, I think that it's, it's a shame not to appreciate where we are. As far as we're aware, this is the most interesting planet there is. We don't know very much about planets elsewhere, but this is very much more interesting than any other planet in the solar system because it has life. And so it's a shame, I think, not to appreciate that life. Sure. Absolutely. And this, you know, it's interesting that you say we picture ourselves in those funny situations, and I have to agree. And I'm curious because, you know, you do have that background in evolutionary behaviors. You know, humans haven't really evolved as many weird behaviors or what we would call weird behaviors that you describe in the book. And I'm curious if, from your own scientific background, if you think there's a reason that we don't have, like, cannibalism or, you know, a female being bigger than a male naturally, something like that, if it's just because we're too complex or or if there's some other idea that you might have about why that is. Well, I think that every, every population of life forms that are interbreeding, so every species... Every species goes down its own path. There's, no, there's nothing that says that human females have to be smaller than males automatically. It's just that this is the path, the evolutionary path that we've gone down, and there are, and there are reasons in the past why that has happened. But it's not stable, it's not static, and one can imagine circumstances that would cause the opposite to happen. I think, you know, when you look at mammals in general, it's very often the female is smaller, but that's also partly, it's a consequence of general mammalian biology, but there's nothing inevitable about it. And I think that, I think that there are, however, very good reasons why in most human cultures, very close sibling, sibling or parent child incest is taboo. Uh, And that's partly because we don't, we don't have a system where you know, where harmful genes are exposed. So in the in the situation that the wasp has, where the males hatch from unfertilized eggs, they only have one chromosome set. So if there are any harmful genes in those chromosome sets, if there are any lethal genes, those are exposed, and so and the male will die. Whereas humans don't have that, and so and so that therefore, very closely related parents are much more likely to share a very deleterious gene, and that gene will be exposed in the child. And the child will die, and so and so that makes very close incest much more risky for us than it is for a wasp, and and so I think that the I, I think that there are ways that we can start to understand human behaviour given the evolutionary context. Having said that, I'm personally not as interested in evolutionary psychology unless you can do very rigorous and wide-ranging experiments because. I think that it's very easy for people to supply their own biases when they're doing, when they're trying to design experiments. And there's a, the field is is a complicated one. There's some certainly some good work, but there's also often a lot of hand waving, and it's very often used to justify the status quo, whatever the status quo is. And I don't find it necessarily very insightful. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much for letting me take the time to interview you. No, not at all. Um, it's, it's nice. It's fun. Thank you for being enthusiastic.